Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. Today's guest is Dr. Jackie Litzkis. She is a professor in the Department of Biology at Laurentian University. Remember that you can ask her questions anytime during the presentation by clicking chat near the top left hand corner of your screen. And uh, don't forget, along with your question, to let us know your name or perhaps where you are joining us from so that we can give you a shout out when we ask your question. So welcome again to Dr. Elitskis, and I will let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Stacy. I will switch to my slideshow now. And so, um, what I wanted to talk to you about a little bit this afternoon was um, life history strategies, evolution, and how it plays into the conservation of turtles. And that's the research program I work on is looking at conservation of freshwater turtles. So I want to start by, from an evolutionary perspective, reminding you that you have one goal in life. And that one thing you need to do is pass on your genes to future generations. So from an evolutionary perspective, this is your agenda. This is what you need to do. And to be able to do that, there's, there's two really important things that you need to be able to do to pass on your genes, to achieve that goal. You need to live, obviously, you need to survive, and you need to have kids, you need to have babies. And these two things together are what constitutes your fitness from that evolutionary perspective. That is your survival and your reproduction. You have to survive, obviously, and then you have to have offspring to pass on those genes to future generations. And so this is Darwinian fitness, evolutionary fitness. And when you think about fitness, you need to think about it from the perspective that it's actually a relative term. It's how well you survive and reproduce compared to somebody in the population that you're competing with. If you survive and reproduce more, you will pass more genes on to future environments. You'll be more fit. So it is this relative term. So this brings up the question of, What's going to cause differences in survival and reproduction among individuals? And it's things in the environment. It's the selective pressures in the environment that cause these differences between individuals and their survival and reproduction. And these selective pressures relate to the concept you've probably learned about called natural selection. And so some of these pressures can include, for example, competition. So how well do you compete against other individuals in the population? If you're a better competitor, you're gonna survive, you're gonna reproduce more, you're gonna be more fit. What about predation? That's another selective pressure in the environment. So if you can survive a predator attack better than another individual in your population, you will also reproduce more successfully, pass on more genes to future environments. And then, the, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just a few things to think about. The third one there is habitat changes. And this is the one from my research perspective that I'm most interested in. Habitat changes can happen sort of from two directions. They can be natural habitat changes. So this might be, for example, a big flooding event that changes a terrestrial environment into an aquatic environment. So if you're a terrestrial animal, you're in big trouble when suddenly your environment is now aquatic. So that's gonna exert some selective pressure on those animals. And then other than natural habitat changes, there are also the habitat changes that are caused by humans, the sort of unnatural habitat changes like road construction or filling of wetlands to build malls or housing developments, whatever it might be. And these are the types of habitat changes that my research focuses on and what impact they have on reptiles, particularly turtles, and also some work on snakes. And so all of these selective pressures acting together cause organisms to develop certain features that make them well adapted to their environment. And so, this results in what we call life history strategies. So the strategy that those animals have to survive and reproduce the best in their environment. And there's three different sorts of strategies that we can talk about. And those strategies arise from differences in the environment. So there's two of those strategies listed here. So one is occurring in unpredictable environments and the other one is occurring in predictable environments. So let's go over the unpredictable environment results first. So in this case, the environment is unpredictable. If you want to survive and reproduce and pass your offspring, pass your genes on to offspring in the next generation, you have to do it 
with this pressure that you might not live until next year. You, because the environment is so unpredictable, the chances of you surviving are really low. So if you want to pass on your genes, you need to grow to maturity as fast as you can, produce your kids as fast as you can, and produce as many as you possibly can, because probably next year you'll be dead. Obviously, that's not very fit. So to be the most fit, you need to have this fast life history, we call it. So you reach adult size really quickly, you reach maturity really quickly so you can reproduce. And in this case, for these fast life histories in these unpredictable environments, usually there's only one chance to reproduce. So you're going to produce as many offspring as you can, but there's a trade-off to that. If you produce a whole bunch of offspring, then they're gonna have to be really small. Because if you think about the energy that can go into reproducing, it's basically like a pie. It's this sort of fixed size and so you can slice the pie in different ways. So if you want to produce a whole bunch of offspring, it's going to have to be a whole bunch of little slices in the pie. But if you want to produce big offspring, then you're only going to have a few slices in that pie. So in these unpredictable environments, there's this tendency to have a whole bunch of little offspring in the hopes that at least some of those will survive to the next generation and that then the genes will be passed on. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the predictable environment. And now in this case, the population is actually sort of doing well. The conditions are really good. Everything's predictable. So populations tend to get quite big. They grow to a large size. And so now if you want to be the one that survives and reproduces the best, you need to be big and strong, highly competitive. So now the selective pressure drives you to a big body size, waiting until you're bigger and older to reproduce for the first time and then producing really big offspring that have a better survival and competitive capability. And so you're going to invest in them and have parental care and take care of them. Because next year, the year after, the year after, the year after, you're gonna survive. It's very predictable. So you can produce a few offspring at a time because next year you can produce a few more and thereafter and thereafter. So you tend to have multiple reproduction events over the lifetime where a few offspring are produced that are big and strong and competitive. So this is what we call a slow life history, slow to mature, slow to develop, long lived. So those are the sort of two general opposite extremes. But there is a third life history strategy, and it's the one that is important to what I want to talk about because it's what applies to turtles. So in this case, this third strategy, life history strategy, we call it bed hedging. And this, you can think of it in terms of how you might bet on a horse race. So if you want to just make sure you get some return for your investment, what you're going to do is say there's 20 horses in the race. You'll put $2, say, on each horse in the hopes that one of them is going to make it and you'll get your $2 return. You'll get your money back, basically. You'll hedge your bets and place a little bit of investment on every single horse in the race. And that's how it works for bed hedging species. They live in environments where it's predictable survivorship for the adults. It's really high survivorship. They're going to survive into the future. But for the eggs or the babies, it's an un unpredictable environment. You never know if those babies are going to make it in any given year. So the survivorship overall is pretty low. But the main thing is it's unpredictable. So you put a little bit of offspring out there every year, every year, every year, in the hopes that one of those nests or one of those litters of babies is going to make it. And so you're hedging your bets by producing a little bit every year. So it's a little bit different. That It's kind of got some aspects of the other two strategies combined. And as I mentioned, this bet hedging strategy, this hedging your bets by producing a little bit over your life, this is what has been applied to turtles. They're sort of the classic bet hedging species. And so some, just to sort of summarize the aspects of what a bet hedger life history strategy looks like. So as I said, they have this high adult survivorship. For turtles, the, tr the chances of an adult surviving from one year to the next are like 97%, 98%. It's really high survivorship. But the eggs, the hatchlings, have a really low, unpredictable survivorship. Some years, every nest gets eaten. Other years, a few nests are going to make it. But those females keep putting those eggs out there in the environment every year for a long time, hedging their bets. They tend to be really long-lived. 100 years is a piece of cake for a turtle. Um, some tortoises can live for up to 200 years, so they have this really long lifespan. And again, that's coupled with reproducing every year, sort of for their whole life, for decades. Um, they have delayed maturity, so they, they delay their first time reproducing so they can be bigger to produce lots of eggs. And they have many small offspring over their lifetimes. They do reproduce forever. Turtles do not um, uh, hit old age. They reproduce until they die. 
there's no parental care except for just nest construction. So a female leaves the water, she walks up onto land, she digs a nest chamber, she buries her eggs in there, covers it up, and then she leaves. So there's no parental care. And this results in a slow life history, like we saw with the, the example in a predictable environment. This sort of similar idea happens in that it's a relatively slow life history strategy. Okay, just to talk about what turtles are for a second, because this provides a context that's important to the discussion. So they are reptiles, although some people may argue that they're so special, they need to be their own category, but we're gonna just keep it sort of simple and say, okay, they're reptiles of the order to studenes. And inside that order, there are 12 different families of pretty different organisms. There's sea turtles in there, the guys that have flippers that live in the ocean, and I, I don't do any research on those, so I don't know as much about those guys. And then there's the tortoises, the guys that have those sort of elephantine feet, and they're totally terrestrial and they tend to be vegetarian. I also don't do any specific research on tortoises. And then there's the third group, which is the turtles, the freshwater turtles. And these are the guys that I focus my research program on. And there's something about turtles that's so obvious, right? They have a shell. They have this amazing shell, this amazing adaptation, and it is the key to their success. And that perfect body form, I would argue, developed about 220 million years ago, that amazing protective mechanism, long before mammals hit the planet. So turtles have been around for a long time, and they've had that body shape, that turtle shape, that shell, for a long time, because it has been the key to their success. Now keep that in mind, that's 200 something million years ago that that evolved. Because now, turtles are in big trouble. About two thirds of the species, even more, across the globe are considered to be species at risk. They're at risk of extinction. So this slide is showing you just a few examples of a couple of articles that have been published in scientific literature saying turtles are in big trouble. We know this, there's lots of reasons why. So what are those reasons? Well, sorry, backing up a second. Let's bring it closer to home and talk about Ontario for a second. So globally, turtles are in huge trouble, but right here in our own home province of Ontario, they're also in big trouble. We have eight species that currently live here. And you can see from this pie chart that these are the different status designations of those turtles. So we have three species that are considered special concern, the snapping turtle, the musk turtle, and the um, northern map turtle. Then we have two species that are considered threatened, the spiny softshell turtle and the blandings turtle. Two species that are considered endangered, that's the wood turtle and the spotted turtle. And then you'll see there, even at the top of the pie chart, the box turtle, which is extirpated. So this is a species that used to live in Ontario and does not live here anymore. It's gone, it's extinct from the province. And then you see the one species there at the top for not assessed, that's the painted turtle. So that of the eight species in the province, seven of them are listed at risk. And the only one that's not listed hasn't even been assessed yet. So maybe when it's assessed, it will be listed as well. And in fact, I can tell you that at the federal level, the, um, the painted turtle is currently being assessed. Okay, so turtles are in trouble, it's clear there's this problem. So what are the threats? Why, why are turtles in such big trouble? And how does this relate back to their life history? Well, habitat loss and fragmentation, this is a killer for anything, and it's not rocket science. If you take an animal's home away, it's not gonna live, it's pretty straightforward. And as humans, we are the kings of habitat modification and habitat destruction. We destroy wetlands, we fragment habitats, and animals can't persist in that landscape. For turtles, another really serious problem is collection for the food and pet trade. Um, and this is a problem because it it's attacks adult turtles. So adult turtles, like you see stacked in this cage for sale, are collected, and also the eggs are collected. And you often, maybe you've heard, heard about that, excuse me, for sea turtles, for example where clutches and clutches of eggs are collected for silly reasons like aphrodisiacs and such. And so turtles are attacked from many directions by this collection for the food and pet trade. In fact, there are some species of turtle who we only know from markets. We don't know anything about them in their natural environment. So this is a big problem. A third problem for turtles is something called subsidized predators. So this cute little fox and this cute little raccoon, they are natural predators of turtle nests and even turtle adults sometimes. And when we're in a natural ecosystem, the pressure that they exert on those turtle populations is okay. Because I told you the bed hedging strategy 
it relies on adult survivorship, but it does allow for eggs and juveniles to die to some degree. The survivorship is unpredictable. So most times when populations are acting normally, we can, they can handle some level of raccoon and fox predation of those eggs. The problem is, as humans, we tend to produce a lot of garbage. And when fo um, fox and raccoon are living close to us, their populations subsist on that garbage. And those populations get way bigger than they're supposed to. And that's subsidized. They're subsidized by our garbage. And so as a consequence, they exert huge pressure on turtle nests, way more than the population can handle no nests survive and of course a population can't persist if no nests are ever surviving so this is another problem especially in urban and suburban environments for turtle populations and then the next threat is road mortality and this is a huge one so this is a map of southern ontario every single black line is a paved road and you can see in some parts of the southern part of the province it's just solid black it's all roads. And in fact, you cannot walk more than 1.5 kilometers without encountering a road. Now, if you're lost and you're walking out on the landscape in Ontario, that's great. You can find your landmark, you find out where you need to be. But if you are a female Blanding's turtle, like the one on the slide there, who's pregnant or gravid with shelled eggs, on your nesting migration, which can be from five to six kilometers long, you're going to encounter a lot of roads and you're going to have a high risk of mortality. And that's a huge problem because you're taking out the mature female, the, the eggs that she's currently carrying, and then the decades and decades of eggs she would keep producing into the future. So it is totally unsustainable, these levels of road mortality that we see in turtle populations, primarily because these mortalities are the adult females who are needed in those populations for reproduction into the future. Okay, so why are turtles in such trouble? Well, that life history strategy, that bed hedging life history strategy, it didn't evolve in the presence of these current threats I'm talking about. 220 million years ago, we weren't here. These threats are all human caused and we're a pretty modern uh, occurrence on the planet, if you will. So that shell, was a great protective mechanism millions of years ago, but that shell is nothing compared to a transport truck driving across it on the highway. That shell is nothing to a wetland that is completely filled in and destroyed, right? So that life history strategy worked to protect turtles before, but with the threats that humans pose, the kinds of mortality threats that we impose, those turtles can't survive it. And this is why their populations are in such big trouble. And the key there again is relating back to that life history strategy and that is that the populations rely on that high survival of adults that 96 to 98 percent that i said survivorship um, so that those individuals can keep reproducing and, and contribute to future generations but again the the levels of mortality that are imposed by these human threats are just not sustainable the life history of turtles is too slow to rebound back from that type of an, of an assault on their populations. And that's what I have to say. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we were able to learn a lot about how this has all come to be and what the current situation is with turtle conservation in mind. If you want to go ahead and click the stop share button, excellent. We'll be able to see a bit more of you while you answer our questions. Please do send in those questions uh, anytime now. We'll just start uh, doing one question at a time here. My first question, I suppose, is um, that came in is, what is being done to reduce road mortality of turtles currently? Or, or what do you think should be done in the future? So there is actually, this is, it's a really good question because there is an active field of science now called road ecology and the particular uh, agenda of that is to figure out ways to mitigate this road mortality problem. And so usually what that includes, this is being done on the landscape, it's being tested on the landscape right now. And the idea is to put fences along the sides of roads, these are exclusion structures to keep turtles off the road, but that channel the turtles to culverts or tunnels, eco passages or overpasses on the road to allow the turtles to safely get across. So we have a fence that funnels them to a safe passage, usually it's under the road for turtles, so that they can get to the other side and continue on their migrations and not be killed. So there's been a lot of work on 
on testing that and looking at the most effective fencing styles and all that kinds of stuff. Very interesting. So are we still in the testing stage then of those types of interventions? Yes, we are. So we've, um, and there's, there's been some really great work done in that field and we know what kind of fence does not work. We know what kind of fence could work better, but it's really expensive. And so what is a compromise? Maybe that we could have a, a moderate expense fence, but invest in the, the people power to keep checking the fence and fixing it. So there's lots of stuff we've learned, but there's a long way to go as well. Um, a long way to go in that field of science. Um, we have a question here from Patsy who wanted to know, as high school students, what can they be doing to help? That's a good question too. Um, as high school, so one of the things you can do is when you do see a turtle trying, I mean, a lot of you have probably seen a turtle trying to cross the road or you've seen a turtle squished on the road. If you drive Highway 69 up north, you'll see it for sure, Highway 400. What you can do on the smaller roads, if it's safe for you to do so, is to get out of your car and carry the turtle across the road in the direction it was going. But I will say with a caveat there, never carry the turtle to somewhere else that you think is better for the turtle. Because, and you know, a lot of people, they do that. They, they take the turtle and then I took it to my camp or my cottage because the habitat looked better. The thing is, is that that turtle is on a nesting migration most likely, and she's probably migrated that route for decades, like literally older than you guys are by a ton. She has been walking that route. It's just that we stuck a road in the way of her normal, you know, nesting route. So relocating her to your camp or your cottage is actually somewhat of a death sentence because she's going to try to home her way back and now she's totally lost. So that's not a good idea. So if it's safe for you to get out of the car and help her across the road, carry her or him because the males disperse as well um, across the road in the direction they were facing and that would be a great help um, there's other ways you can get involved with local naturalist groups in your community that maybe are doing some habitat work to to help turtles or turtle monitoring in a lot of places we don't even know how many turtles are there or what species are there so getting involved as a volunteer for monitoring programs like with the toronto zoo adopt a pond for example would be excellent things that you could do as well. Excellent. Um, I now have a question from Emily and Emily is asking if the if the females and males leave the nest and that is increasing their mortality rate, uh, why don't turtles stay near the nest or around the area? You mean why? So is, is Emily asking why don't the mothers stay and protect the nests and show parental care? I, I think that's how I would in, interpret this question. Emily, if we're wrong, you can feel free to, to chat in a, a correction there. But the, the increased mortality rate, so for example, you mentioned the, the foxes and the raccoons that are being subsidized oh, by right. humans. So there are more attacks on these nests. Why wouldn't they perhaps change their behavior? And so that reflects back to this life history strategy that they have which evolved millions, 200 million years ago. It's, it, they can't just quickly evolve parental care. That type of change, like fundamental change in the strategy of an organism takes generations and generations and generations. And so it's unlikely that we would see that happening before our eyes because we have such a, a short blink of lifetime compared to the evolution of turtles. But I can tell you that a strategy that's being used, so, you know, as humans, we, for those of us that are worried about conservation issues, we try to step in and, and sort of surrogate what a mother might do. And so she can't, so mother turtles do not protect their nests, but maybe we can step in and help. So there's a protocol to actually put a cage over top of the nest to keep the raccoons and the foxes and stuff out. And we know that these cages work to keep predators out. So there are a lot of conservation programs, stewardship programs that involve this caging of nests to keep predators out. And we know that that works. So that's a strategy being used in places where subsidized predation is a huge problem. It's interesting that you mentioned that because a few days ago, I actually saw several of these little cages, essentially a little uh, a two by four uh, square of lumber and, uh, and a cage over top just in an area of grass marked as, um, you know, a turtle nest. But then how do the, the hatchlings actually get out? How does that so, work? So that is also a very important point. So you have to keep an eye on the nest. So we know that turtle nests take anywhere from 60 to 90 days to incubate, and it depends on the temperature. When it's hot, development's really fast. When it's cold, development is slower. 
So when you think the nests might start to hatch, you need to then go out and patrol again so you can release the hatchlings out of that nest cage. Um, and you have to keep a very close eye on things because if you wait too long, the babies could dry out and die So because they're trapped under that cage. So you need to go out there and make sure that you can re rescue them, release them. And another way, not with those wooden sided cages that you mentioned, but there are cages that are also all wire. Some people put a little trap door in the bottom and they flip it up. So it's just this little tiny door that a hatchling turtle can get out and that hopefully no raccoon or fox can figure out how to get in there. So it hopefully helps. And then we usually, when we cut one of those little doors, we cut it on the side of the cage facing the water in the hopes of trying to funnel those little dudes down to the water so that they'll be safe. Very interesting. So I guess we're likely in sort of the testing phase of, of those um, protections as well to, to see how well they're working. Actually, that is less in the testing stage. We know they work. They have been tested quite extensively, and we know that they can be 100% successful if they're deployed correctly and monitored correctly. But what we recently wondered about and have tested is when you put a cage over top of a, a batch of eggs, do you change how the babies are developing inside of those eggs? We wondered if it changes temperature or it changes different things about how the babies develop. And the good news is, is it doesn't. One of my graduate students actually tested that explicitly comparing three different types of nest cages to uncaged nests. And the really good news is we're not messing up the babies. They develop normally, so that's great. Because the last thing you want is to apply a conservation strategy that then has these secondary negative consequences. Like what if you cage them? Sure, the raccoon can't eat them, but all the babies are totally messed up in there. Right. So now we know they're not. So that's a really good finding from that work. Excellent. Um, we now have a question from Tenzin. Uh, is there any reservation place for turtles so they can be safe and remain for a long time? Mm, like a protective park area. Well, turtles in the province of Ontario, at least, a lot of them do occur in our Ontario parks and also on um, federal park lands. And so in theory, they are protected in those places. Um, on private land, it's harder to protect them, but we do, in the province of Ontario, we have an Endangered Species Act, which is quite a powerful piece of legislation. And even on private land, you're not allowed to destroy habitat for species that are listed as endangered or threatened species. So there are those sort of protective mechanisms, but they're hard to enforce. That's one of the issues is just, how do you enforce that law? You, you need, you know, conservation officers on the ground all the time, and it's just not possible to do that. So um, we do hope that in places like Ontario Parks that the turtles will be safer and more protected. And a lot of um, park staff are involved in doing these types of protective projects, like the nest caging and the, the road monitoring and stuff. It's happening a lot in our Ontario Parks. I've actually partnered with Ontario Parks quite a bit for the research that we do. They've been a fantastic partner. That's interesting. The Ontario parks and the national parks as well. Those are the places where I know I personally have seen those uh, those nest cages in action. And a few of the the tests for um, those sort of underpasses for turtles under the road as well uh, in full swing. So um, maybe a couple more general questions. We had a question from. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to try my best to say this correctly. Uh, yes, Yesenia Rodriguez, uh, how did you decide you wanted to study turtles? Uh, you know, I have this incredibly amazing opportunity job that my childhood fascination has turned into my career. I, taught, I, I, I teach all about turtles and conservation and stuff, do my research on it. But as a little kid, my brother drug me around Brawny Park dragged me around Brawny Park, catching snakes and turtles. It started from then, and uh, he's now a high school biology teacher, and I'm a biology professor. So it is an amazing privilege to be able to turn my career, drip, to build my career from what was my passion as childhood. Um, going out and catching turtles, uh, that, was, that was what did it. And then I finished that a little bit. I then had an opportunity to teach biology at a canoe tripping camp, and at that camp, I then discovered a lot of different species of turtles that I had never seen before. And I found old data records for the turtles that had been monitored by other biology teachers at that camp. And that was like 
opening a treasure trove of knowledge. It was amazing. And so then that, that was the real turning point. And I learned how to paddle a canoe, which was the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, what do you get to do in, um, in along with your field work? Do you go on canoe trips to, to collect samples or data from the field? What does that look like? Yeah. So, um, some of our study sites are only water access. We have to paddle in to get to them. Most of our study sites we can get pretty close to by road and then we hike in. But yeah, I get to explore incredible wetlands um, in the deep forests of Ontario that remain. And it's pretty awesome in river systems to be able to do that. But we also work in sort of uh, semi-developed habitats as well. We do do a lot of uh, road ecology works. Of course, we're actually on the road itself. But yeah, I have an annual trip that I do every year to a study site where I've been working since 1991, to date myself, um, that we only can access by canoe. And the whole trip is done out of tent and uh, traveling from site to site by canoe. And it's incredible. Um, I try not to bring a cell phone. I try not to bring a computer and just go and uh, commune with the turtles. And so who goes with you on that team? You obviously don't perform the research just yourself. You have a team that goes with you? Yes, so typically the, the people driving the research are the graduate students that I supervise. So I have master's students and I have PhD students. And so they are the actual ones that get credit for all of this. So they are the ones out there in the field driving the questions, driving the research, collecting the data. And I'm just sort of in the back helping to facilitate it and, and help them hone their questions and maybe analyze their data and then write up the papers that we produce from this research. But um, most of that, yeah, it's it's the students that would generally have uh, one field assistant or two field assistants to help them do stuff. We have a project in Algonquin Park where we've been monitoring snapping turtles and painted turtles for over 40 years. And that project is based out of a, a research station that's in Algonquin Park. And it's done by a, we, the turtle crew. So I usually hire three or four people that focus on that long-term study every summer. And I'm partnering with a retired professor from Guelph to keep that project going. He started it and then I'm helping him to keep it going. That sounds really excellent. So if, we ha if we've if we hooked any students who as kids were catching turtles and snakes and now they think this sounds pretty neat, uh, what advice might you have for them as they perhaps pursue a career um, in research and, and potentially in biology or reptilian research? I think one of the most important things for me anyhow was to do something I was excited about. Um, and this is particularly true for research because research always presents challenges. I mean, any career actually is going to present challenges, but you got to love it so you can stick it out through those challenges. Um, so like I said, I've had this rare privilege to turn my childhood hobby and fascination into a career because I love it. I love what I do. And that's, that's the key thing. Um, and I also, I think it's important, this is a personal philosophy thing, but I think it's more important to choose what you love over, as, as important over the money. I had opportunities that would have paid me more money for a summer job, for example, but I took the lesser paying job because it was more important to me for developing myself. And the classic, ex the, the exact example there is that biology teaching position I had at the canoe tripping camp. I got paid very little to do that job and I had OSAP which I paid off. I can show you the letter posted on my office wall. I paid that baby off that loan, but it was more important for me to get that experience teaching biology to those kids and all that, than it was to go work in a factory and make a ton of money. Um, and there are ways to pay for a university doing that. Like there is OSAP and there are those things. And yes, it might seem like right now those expenses are so high and you're not sure how you can do it, but if you love what you do and you pursue that, it works out in the end. Maybe that sounds way too, um, <laughs> you know, silver lining pie, I don't know, but I, I think that's really important. I think you have to love what you do. I think it's so important. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your passion with us today and the information that you've shared with us about uh, the evolution of turtles and, and what's facing them now in terms of conservation and what our students can do to help. My pleasure.